This is The Unimaginable. I'm your host and musician, James Brown. This episode features the model and actor, Katrina Balfe, who plays Ma in the Oscar award-winning movie, Belfast, and Claire in the hit TV show, Outlander. After Katrina's story, we have a coffee and a conversation about things like ambition, low self-esteem, and the value of taking risks. I grew up outside of a small town called Monaghan, right on the border of Southern Ireland and Northern Ireland. And I'm part of a very big family. I'm number four out of five children, but then I have a foster sister and a foster brother. So really I'm four out of seven kids. I went to a very small primary school. Um, There was, I think, nine in my year. And I think at the time I was there, um, there was about 105 in the entire school. But it was one of those places, you know, for some reason, especially in my year, that was a really toxic culture of bullying. You know, a lot of the time I would have been the recipient of that. I think it was it was very much in those years that it sort of solidified a desire in me to get out of there and leave and travel and see the world. I think something like that gives you sort of this fire within you. You definitely want to sort of prove something, whether it's to yourself or to other people, that you're going to make something of yourself. So it was in secondary school when we started, or when I started doing a lot more school plays. And the one that is most memorable is I did a play um, about Anne Frank, and I got to play Anne. And um, I remember having to do like the accent and um, working a lot on that. And it actually was the first time I think I felt like I was doing a character or trying to change myself drastically to be a character. And that was the first time I was like, oh yeah, okay, this is this is what I want to do. So at the end of uh, secondary school, I went to college in Dublin to study drama. And you know, I remember talking to my parents about the fact that I was going to, to study drama instead of something, you know, like journalism or, or something more serious, which is what I think they wanted me to do. And they weren't on board or, or they weren't, uh, I don't think they were very excited about the idea, but I remember telling them, well, it's speech and drama. So at least, you know, I'll come out of this with a qualification that allows me to, to teach <laughs> if things go wrong. And then at the end of my first year of that course, my attendance record wasn't the best. So um, I think I, I had to repeat an exam because I was in danger of flunking. And, you know, I was I, I think I was just loving being free and living life away from my strict parents in Dublin. And at the end of that year, a model scout found me, I suppose is the word, or I got scouted by a model agent and offered me to start modeling part time, which was fun. And it was a way for me to earn some money. Um, During that summer, a scout came over from Paris and offered to take me to Paris. You know, whatever about the modeling side of it, but that offer to go to this, you know, foreign city, which was, you know, in my head, just so romantic and had all of these beautiful stories about it. um, That was just so exciting to me. And I remember having to go home to my mother and father and say, um, yeah, so I'm taking a year out of college and uh, I'm going to go to Paris and, (laughs) um, you know, not going to be an actress anymore. I'm going to be a model. So I think they were uh, slightly uh, disappointed. I lived there on and off for two years. um, But when I first went, this was sort of the height of the Brazilian phenomena. So it was all Giselle and those girls and these Brazilian bombshells, which I did not look like. You know, initially I wasn't working a huge amount. I was very pasty pale Irish and I had met this Irish guy and we decided we'd go traveling. I took some time off. So when I went back to modeling, you know, I think always in the back of my head, I was like, well, I'll just do this for another few years or I'll just do this for another little while and I'll go back to being an actor. And it's funny. It's one of those things that years just sometimes fly by (laughs) without you noticing. 
And it's a funny world once you are sort of in it. It's a very insular bubble in a way. And I think you can get very lost in that. I think a lot of people have this perception of models as these very stuck up, overly confident young women who are just super privileged. But, you know, my experience is very, very different to that. You know, I think at least for me, you know, it's a very lonely business. I think it can be very tough on your confidence and your self-esteem. When I was sort of doing it for about seven, eight years, I was like, okay, I've got to figure my way out of this. And I was just really hungry to get back to acting or to see if it was still something that, you know, I was passionate about or that I would love as much as I used to. And I was really scared that if I didn't try and you know, at least give it a shot that I'd be, you know, that I would regret not following a dream for the rest of my life. So, yeah, so I suppose after 10 years I left and I moved to L.A. So then I was given an audition for a role of Claire from a, a book series of Outlander. You know, generally when you do an audition, um, at least when you're starting out, which is what I was doing. Um, you're only really given, you know, two scenes or something like that, and maybe a three or four sentence log line. That's what's kind of hard when you are auditioning in the beginning because you don't really have a good sense of what the character is. But, you know, for this role, having been told about the book and getting to read it, you know, all of a sudden I, I was privy to her internal monologue to the whole sort of breadth of her journey. And, you know, you got the sense of just what an amazing character she was. She had this fire in her belly. She was gutsy. She was fearless. And she just had this real lust for life and this deep passion for living and also for justice, which is the stuff that, at least whether <laughs> I have it in my life or not, it's definitely the stuff that I strive for. After season one, we had a long hiatus before season two. So I was lucky enough to film Money Monster in New York. It was really an amazing experience. Even though Outlander was doing really well, in some ways you're kind of like, oh, you're now in a successful show. You're still not really on the lists of all the best projects. And I think a lot of the time your greatest gift or your greatest power at that point in your career is saying no instead of yes. Then between seasons four and five, Ford versus Ferrari came up, which, first of all, I love a good sports movie. <laughs> uh, second of all, I love car racing. Um, there's really amazing people involved, you know, Christian Bale, Matt Damon, John Bernthal, Tracy Letts, and it was uh, James Mangold. You know, it was just, it was one of those kind of dream roles. And even though it wasn't a huge role, she had enough in her and it was like enough good things to sort of sink your teeth into that was really fun. So then after season five, a film came along which I wouldn't have been able to do except that um, because of COVID, production had been pushed on Outlander and that was Belfast. I guess it's, it's one of those gifts that come along very rarely and I, I hope I've not been absolutely spoiled now and <laughs> it's going to be hard to to top a film like this, but it's a story from home. Um, even though I'm not from Belfast, it's very close to where I grew up. It's a coming of age story, really, but it also has the troubles in the background and they were in the background my entire childhood. So it's stuff that I could really relate to. This beautiful film came when, when I wasn't really expecting to be able to do anything. I think you know, when I look back, I suppose in some way, my motto has been like, oh, fuck it, let's just do it. If you're open to opportunities, you know, if somebody says to you, do you want to go to Paris next week? I've always been like, yeah, why not? Like, let's let's give it a shot. You want to go to New York? Sure, I'll, I'll do that. And even though a lot of the times that's been quite scary, I think I've benefited so much from just that part of me that's always been sort of willing to step into the unknown. You know, I'm definitely somebody that believes in the part that luck has to play in life. I think I've definitely been a recipient of a lot of luck. 
but I also think I've been open to it. And I think I've also backed that up with hard work. And any time I have been given an opportunity, I think I, I work really hard and I don't take it for granted. You know, one of the differences I, I've seen about people who make it in this business, and maybe this is true for other things as well, but one of the things is that it's just the doing. You know, I think a lot of people, they self-sabotage or they hinder themselves or they hold themselves back because of fear or insecurity. You know, they sort of feel like they don't know enough or they don't have the skills enough to do something. But, you know, very often you'll, you'll meet people who don't have those skills or they don't know, but they just go ahead and they do it. And you're going to learn on the job anyway. You're going to learn by failing. So you just have to go for it. Because I think if you're waiting to have everything in the perfect order or, you know, having all the classes done or all of these things in place before you go and do the thing, um, the opportunities will have passed you by by that point. What did your parents do for a living? My dad is retired. He was a police sergeant, or as we call them back home, Garda Shiakana. <laughs> what does that mean? Garda Shiakana? The Shiakana part. I know that guard, guard's like obviously Isn't it something to be in, in a guard. Shiakon, is it? I think it's like... Oh, gar Guardians of the Peace? Something like that, I think. I could be wrong. I'm going to have to check that out. <laughs> and my mum was a stay-at-home mum for most of our childhood. And then she was also a marriage counsellor. A marriage counsellor? Mm-hmm. Has she had to talk to you guys? <laughs> <laughs> I will not be having those conversations with my mother. <laughs> um, and you mentioned that uh, they had you had a couple of foster siblings. How did your parents end up getting involved in fostering children? So I think when I was about six or seven, I don't know exactly who. I mean, I think it was the local social workers just were asking or canvassing the community trying to find families because they really needed families to take people to take kids in and my parents were asked and I, I don't know you know this is something I should probably sit down and ask them but I don't know how much discussion there was I don't know how much they thought about it my parents are really they're big-hearted people I don't think they necessarily thought it through so much having siblings that like in a non-traditional way that are like foster siblings how did that affect your perspective, like your world perspective? Like looking back, do you think that it did have any effect on you at all? Because like, I just don't know what, what it would be like to, to kind of grow up in that environment. Well, I think, you know, being really young, the first couple of kids that we were, or that were housed with us, you know, the first baby, we picked her up from the hospital and we had her for nine months and then she was adopted. That was really hard because you have this baby and mm -hmm. she's with you for nine months and then she's gone and you never see her hear from her again um and we did that again where we picked up a little boy from hospital and we had him for two years but then his mom got custody back so he sort of came in and out of our lives but i think as a young person seeing all of that i think it teaches you a lot about other people's circumstances. I like to think that that's what I took away from all of that, that you sort of have a, a greater capacity for empathy and understanding other people because, you know, you're not just getting the sort of view of your own traditional family. You know, you understand a bit more about, okay, well, some families are broken and people aren't always as fortunate as you are. And you know, and I think that's also something when you grow up in a place where there's conflict or you're adjacent to conflict like we were, you do have a different understanding of the complexities of life mm -hmm. as opposed to if you grew up somewhere that was very sheltered where, you know, everyone has a white picket fence and nothing bad happens, right. you know. Like I remember, I remember having conversations with my friend Sandra where you're debating pretty heavy stuff as kids because you're trying to understand the world around you and what's happening and why people are, you know, blowing each other up and why people are, you know, separated and what is religion and why is religion separating us. And 
I don't know. I mean, look, it's hard to understand what what your life would have been without the circumstances of your life, right? Right. Because you only know that. Mm. Yeah, but I I have to imagine that those things shaped me. Yeah, shaped me very deeply, I, I would have to say. Did any of your other siblings end up doing anything in the arts? In the arts, no. No, so I am you're, you're the lone wolf. I am the black sheep okay. of the family. Your folks are probably pretty proud of you, but I think there was a time where they might not have been so happy with your decision making with like leaving college. What do they think of you now whenever they see you on TV and films and getting awards? Do they do they still think that you should have, you know, gone down the traditional path or, or are they, you know, are they have they kind of backpedaled a little bit? I think at this point they are proud. I think that's probably m- quite recent. <laughs> you know, it's hard to know. My parents are not very effusive. They're they're quite stoic, and uh, I think all of my siblings, we've all done pretty all right in our various different fields. So I like that my parents aren't super enamored by the entertainment business, mm. and they don't kind of like get sort of. So they don't go to the movies. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> but I like that they don't get sort of swept away with the whole thing and like Yeah. It's kind of nice that they don't change, but they also as uh recently they went on TV themselves. So <laughs> what, 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 like what did they talk about you? <laughs> yeah, they talked about me. I still haven't watched it, but <laughs> they didn't tell me until after they'd done it. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, so the 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 self-esteem thing like there was uh obviously you had the, the kind of confidence of somebody that you would think didn't have any self-esteem problems because you would just jump on a flight and go to Paris and or jump on an opportunity to go to New York. Do the two things have anything in common? I think in some ways my way of getting away from myself is also being really busy and doing other things and not having to like think about what I'm doing. And I would also say my excitement for adventure is probably stronger than my worry about what I'm actually going to do once I get there. It's one thing like I would find myself in situations where I would just have been like, yeah, fuck it. Like I'll go to Paris. And then that first time I remember then you're just given instructions about get a bus, get off at this street, go to this house or this door number. And the entire time you're just filled with absolute self-loathing and and fear because you're like, what the fuck am I doing? Mm -hmm. Why did I put myself in this situation? I don't know where I am. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, what was I thinking? Yeah. (laughs) So I think I always jump first and then think about it later. (laughs) Have you ever looked back at your low self-esteem and thought about where that came from? Yeah. As a child being bullied like that, sort of that kind of experiencing that kind of loneliness. Like that's one thing I really remember strongly. Like it it used to be the thing that filled me with the biggest dread as well was this idea of loneliness in my future too. Mm -hmm. But that's something I think when you feel that as a kid, it can have a really lasting impact on you. And I think that's also why I'm such a social person and I like to have people around and, but I definitely think with age, I've learned to appreciate my own company a lot more. I value my own time now. I'm still a fun slut, but (laughs) I I don't know. I think, yeah, I, I, I spent quite a bit of time in therapy when I was in my early thirties, when I first came to LA, because I, I think that was also a time of huge reckoning for myself, trying to figure out how I'd sort of gotten to where I was at, starting a whole new thing and knowing that I didn't have all of the tools. And I think if I hadn't gone into therapy at that point, I don't know that I would have been able to kind of get through those lean years and look after myself. I think you said a couple of times that you've always had this propensity to make something of yourself or do something that's really worthwhile where did that come from? What was that? Where was that drive coming from? I don't know. I mean, maybe the same place. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think very often 
you know, when we're hurt and we feel small, our biggest desire is to sort of feel big, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, yeah, your your ego is what masks your insecurity. So whether or not that was the genesis of it, I'd like to think now, I hope I don't sort of have that drive from a place of ego. Mm -hmm. I think hopefully now it's more about a a desire to like do good work and all of those things. But I'm sure <laughs> there's yeah. some of that still tied in there. Yeah, well, I think our egos are there to help us throughout different stages of our lives. Like for, for that, it could be um, helping you succeed, you know, and then as you succeed, um, it can morph or change into something else, you know? Yeah, I think there's definitely healthy ego and very unhealthy ego. I have a friend, she's an artist, and she talks about quite often that when she's doing a piece and if she gets doubtful or if she starts to sort of second guess herself, she almost imagines that there's this like male artist in her head who just doesn't give a shit. And that's the, that's what helps her drive through and push through an idea. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, there's definitely a part of that where, you know, and it it's, goes back to talking about people who just do. I'm someone who procrastinates hugely. It's my thing that I fucking hate about myself the most. And I'm trying to learn to just do things more, you know, not to worry about, whether I feel like I don't have everything sort of in order and, you know, or whether I'm not, I don't have the experience or I haven't done it before. And it's just like, no, you just have to do it. Dose of healthy ego <laughs> helps with that. I don't know. Yeah, it's been something I've thought about a lot, like a therapist that I've been to see, which has been really helpful for me. One of the things he talks about with ego is like, you know, it's like you have the ability as a human to uh, take control over what's going on inside your body and your head, your soul, your spirit. Um, you know, and a lot of times I think people misunderstand their ego because it's, it's usually coming from a place of, well, it's something's happened in your life and now you've got this thing that you're scared of or that you really don't want that to happen again. So now, you know, you develop an attitude or you develop a way of coping with that, which one thing that I've been really interested in is, is trying to take control of those things that happen to us and face them and move through them. And in your case, it relates because, you know, you've really gone out there and done things and taken those risks and, and not been held back by your previous experiences in life, whatever they may be. You know, one thing about when I was a kid, there was no real example of people locally that had become actors, had done the thing that I wanted to do. And that was sort of what was really hard. It was sort of like, how do I get out of this place? How do I become what do I want to become? But I think sometimes when you're pushed like that, or you, you feel sort of like the world is against you in a way, that was what in some ways, like, solidified this like desire within me to kind of, I don't know, prove it to myself or prove it to other people, but you know, that I was going to, I was going to sort of get out there and make something of myself. Good Risings. I'm Brian, co-host of the Good Risings podcast, Grateful Grains. Good Risings is a collection of daily health and wellness related mini shows. It's a set of bite sized segments served up to be your quick inspiration, your much needed motivation, your tiny dose of information, and even a little bit of astrological direction. Listen to them all or skip through what doesn't serve you. It's the perfect daily practice for anyone looking to live life more mindfully with a little bit more intention. Subscribe and join us every weekday morning or browse our library of thousands of bingeable episodes. You can find Good Risings on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Did you know that 20 U.S. veterans die by suicide every single day? I'm Dr. Ron Hirschberg, host of Homebase Nation, the official podcast of the Homebase National Center of Excellence for Veteran and Family Care. Every day, our team fights to lower that number 
and to heal the invisible wounds of war. It's that stigma of like, no one's going to certify me as crazy or insane or having mental issues. But now it's, hey, talk about it. In this show, we talk with extraordinary people doing extraordinary things, all to support our veterans and military families. And I think brotherhood really forms in crisis. You know, that's when everything erases. You might be of different races, but now you're going to have to watch each other's back. Especially in the beginning of my recovery, it was hard for me to want to do things for myself. But the moment that I turned around and said, hey, you know, I'm not in this alone. And if I can't do it for myself, then I need to do it for other people. So join Home Base Nation and this shared mission that serves the veterans and family members who have served us. Listen to and follow Home Base Nation on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. In a world where bad stuff happens, it's easy to forget about the cool stuff that happens too. Cool stuff done by cool... Uh, no, no, okay, I can't take myself seriously. Hold on. Hi, I'm Margaret Kiljoy. I'm a science fiction author, a feminist, an activist, and I'm the host of Cool People Who Did Cool Stuff, a podcast from Cool Zone Media that tells you exactly what it's about right there in the title. It's easy to get overwhelmed by all the monstrous stuff happening everywhere, right? So it's important to hold on to the good. Me, I'm particularly interested in the rebels, the revolutionists, and all the people who fight back. So every week, I'm going to bring you a new story about those people, about all the amazing things that they got up to, so that we realize that we too can fight for the world to be better. Every Monday and Wednesday, I'll be joined by comedians, writers, journalists, and friends to talk through not just the stories, but what they mean for us today. Listen to cool people who did cool stuff on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. There's two obvious sliding doors moments in Katrina's story. One was the choice to quit university and become a model. And the other was moving to LA to pursue her dream of becoming an actor. It's hard to imagine what her life would look like had she not followed her dreams. I think what's unimaginable about people who aren't held back by fear or insecurity is the world of possibility in their future. When an opportunity comes your way and you know in your gut something you'd love to do. Remember not to procrastinate for too long because that's when fear creeps in. And by that time, it may be too late. You've just listened to The Unimaginable. I'm your host, James Brown. Until next time. 